Jonathan, you established Jonathan M. Schiff Productions 1988. That's 20-something years ago. Um, how did that start? How did the business start? And how did you finance the start of the business? Well, before I started in the business, I was a lawyer. I was actually trained as a lawyer. And uh, I got very bored being a property lawyer pretty quickly. But although it gave me very good grounding for intellectual property and for a lot of the contractual side of the business and so on, um, I founded uh, my company because I had a little a daughter and my wife and I found there was not much for her to watch. <laughs> there was in fact um, very little for kids to watch and it was the days where uh, video was the new big thing as there will always be sort of spokes from the content wheel and different delivery formats. Um, and I thought, well, you know, this, there was uh, an opportunity uh, to, uh, to produce something for kids of a different style, different visual style. I mean, backing up a bit, I had, having been a lawyer, I had gone to Swinburne and done the postgraduate course, so I had a grounding. I was mentored by, uh, by uh, two very established filmmakers, John Rowane and Ellery Ryan, who nurtured me through that. And uh, I was lucky to have that. And then I went to Crawford's and trained as a producer and acted as a lawyer. So I had a bit of a win, a give, give and take there. Um, and so I set out really stumbling into the kids area to make something for my daughter, frankly. And I did a little half hour video on the pandas. It was the bicentennial, 1988, and the Chinese pandas were visiting the Melbourne Zoo. And the little half hour documentary, I was able to then market around Europe and America, literally knocking on doors. And so I started door knocking. Um, and that's probably the sharp point of being a producer, really. Um, so those were the first deals that you negotiated? They were the first deals, and the program, unfortunately, was a huge success. And I made quite a bit of money on it. I think I was made £9,000 on one sale to Channel 4. And of course, that was uh, a very misleading signal from the marketplace, because later I realised it wasn't all that simple. But it gave me tremendous self-confidence that, OK, well, I've got a personal connection. I've knocked on the doors, you know. At one point, I went into the lobby of um, uh, MTV Systems Nickelodeon in New York, and I, I asked to meet the, uh, the head of acquisitions, who was the president of Nickelodeon. And I was quite... Um, I wouldn't say abusive to the receptionist, but I was pretty obsessive and pretty forceful. And like most emerging producers, being obsessive is a tremendous asset. In fact, most experienced producers being obsessive is a tremendous asset. But unfettered obsessive behaviour. Um, as a result, my brother who was with me, who was running uh, a music video company, Palomar at the time, walked out in disgust and said I was being rude. But the president of, MT of Nickelodeon came out and she, took a, she said she'd give me five minutes. And after 45 minutes, she bought the show and became a lifelong friend, Linda Kahn, who today is running Scholastic Productions and still looks back and abuses me for that meeting. But the reality was that was an example of going to the front end of the marketplace, meeting people face to face, doing the pitch, either living or dying by the pitch, in, you know, under the pressure of the pitch, um, and trying to convince people that they couldn't live or broadcast without your project. You know? So it was a good learning experience. When did that sort of stumbling start become a business that you could plan and manage and forecast its future? Probably at that point, because I was already, you know, I was, I was working, I was freelancing a bit as an AD, and I was hopeless as an AD. I think I did three weeks as an AD. Um, and uh, I was still freelancing as a lawyer, so I still had my practicing certificate. I was still doing a bit of legal work to sort of pay the mortgage. Um, uh, but at that point, I kind of realized, you know, there's a bit of a niche here for kids TV. I've just been knocking on a lot of doors around the world. And I'm seeing that the kids TV market is niche. It's narrow, but doesn't have a lot of players. You know, it's a pretty small pond, uh, but it's a defined pond, you know, it's a, it, there, are, there are 20, 30 people in the world that seem to be buying and if you can get across the door with one or two of them, then you probably have a go. Whereas the prime time doorway was blocked by larger players, Crawford's included. Um, so I kind of then decided that I'd take the wildlife idea into a pilot for a new project um, uh, called Secret Animals, which was a documentary style project about animals of the world which I'd film in wildlife parks rather than go out into the wild, which was too prohibitive. I went to 52 wildlife parks and zoos around the world at my expense on my solicitor's overdraft at this time. The first $10,000 was my solicitor's overdraft. 
And accompanied by a guy that I'd trained at Crawford's with, Tony Kavanagh, who today is very successful, uh, a major producer, um, I stumbled through researching on uh, traveling with a, you know, two Mac computers that came out the size of the suitcase. Um, and we databased thousands of animals around the world for this shoot. And then, uh, and I learned something then straight away, which was taking on something ambitious and taking on something that was logistically well nigh impossible could only be done by someone small, but had to be done by someone crazy enough you know, to take that on. So there was um, a, a sort of territory here that was not occupied by people who kind of weren't thinking on that scale, uh, as in local parochial programming, not occupied by the larger players because it just was too cost inefficient for them to, to go around and do something of that nature. And frankly, I laid the building blocks of our whole company without realizing it by doing such a fiddly, complex endeavor but when I rolled up then in the lobby of Telemage, who I met, the largest distribution production company in Paris, um, what was known as an all-woman company, I think they had one token man on staff, and, uh, and Simone Harari, the president, was the Time Businesswoman of the Year. It was a very successful French company um, doing the soaps and so on. They had a relationship with Crawford's, who was my ex-employer, so I had at least some point of referee, you know. They bought many of the successful Crawford shows and so on. They really uh, saw my vision uh, again over the pitch. I and mean, they took me out for a sandwich. It wasn't a slap up lunch, it was a sandwich across the road in a, in a French brasserie. Um, but over that lunch, they basically, I said to them, look, I'll put up half the budget of this show if you put up the rest. And they said, well, do you realize, um, you know, we're gonna need a bond? And I said, well, I, I couldn't afford a bond. So I tell you what, if I go over budget by one franc in those days, um, I'll surrender the negative to you and you can pay me out my share after you recoup. Well, they thought that was either so bold or so stupid, you know, that the guy is either so out there or he actually might come good on this, that they did it. And we actually did, uh, Secret Animals was done for a million Australian. I put up half, they put up half. Was, um, that, was that idea just something it was on the spur of the moment? It was very spur of the moment and extremely foolish. And I wouldn't advise anybody to do that. And certainly I hadn't told my wife that I was putting up a house effectively as collateral for the project. But my wife was a great supporter and a true, you know, she had an independent business of her own. She was a great believer. Um, effectively, nothing's changed. Today we're doing, you know, tens of millions of dollars of production, but my house is still security for the business. And I'll come, I'd like to talk about that if we get a chance. But um, the reality was that uh, those two endeavors, you know, coming up with something ambitious, and logistically demanding and having the preparedness to actually put yourself on the line for it were the building blocks of every producer effectively um, defining what your niche market is and defining your financial approach what then uh, to to what extent then were you a one-man band at that stage i was very much a one-man band i had a i had a lass who was uh, acting as my uh, PA and secretary and supporter and emotional supporter at the other end of the line in Australia, but effectively, I was um, flying in at my. I was in, you know, going in, effectively using the proceeds from my pandas documentary to fuel my first approach at a series, um, and uh, uh, you know, I was very much a one-man band, um, but it worked in the sense the French company Telemage did come in. Uh, and uh, Fox Lauber, a distributor in, in New York, came in. And then I went and hired a lass who was uh, Jenny Cleavers, who today is with the ABC Natural History Unit, uh, is a very successful wildlife producer. At that time was a zoologist with a passion for filmmaking. And I thought, well, that's a good fit. I don't know much about animals. <laughs> I'm gonna need a... And Jenny and I then recruited a crew, a small crew, which we got from uh, guys I went to film school with and so on. And, um, you know, spent three months going around uh, uh, France and America and Canada and, and the US and so on, um, filming animals in wildlife parks. Uh, you know, it was very, very logistically ambitious, but it was very successful. It was a handsome stock footage library. Um, it became a very solid little children's series at a time when, as of today, where non-fiction for children's, in terms of series, is quite rare.